Welcome to Loyola Marymount University, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary in 2011. Uh, this urban lecture series is sponsored by the Center for the Study of Los Angeles and the Chicano Studies Department and the Political Science Department. Today, we're going to talk about local politics, specifically the emergence of Latino elected officials and the impact that demographics and redistricting have had, especially in some of these uh, smaller cities in Los Angeles County. I have with me today several guests who have been involved for many years in uh, LA and LA County politics. Um, first, uh, I have next to me uh, Francisco Leal, who's currently the uh, city attorney for the city of Huntington Park and is also of counsel for the um, Community Development Commission of the city of Maywood. He's also served as city attorney for many other cities and has been involved for a long time. Uh, he did his bachelor's degree at Yale University and got his law degree from Harvard. Um, I'm sorry that he wasn't able to get into Loyola Marymount University, so he had to choose other universities, but <laughs> you, you tried, but it was a, a good effort. Uh, Mr. Uh, Francisco Leal. Um, sitting next to him is Mr. Steve Vettis, who holds seat number three on the Los Angeles Community College Board of Trustees. This is the largest community college board of trustees in the nation. The district is actually at large and encompasses a geographic area that is almost one third the county, and it covers way beyond the city of Los Angeles and about 20 other cities, I, I, I believe. Uh, before that, he served as a council member uh, for the city of uh, San Fernando. He also went to a uh, nearby university for both his uh, master's and, and uh, bachelor's degree, although we're not allowed to mention the name of that university, but okay, UCLA. Um, uh, Luis, uh, uh, our, our next guest is uh, um, uh, Luis, who went, to, uh, who also went to a, a great Jesuit university, Santa Clara, and got his master's uh, from Harvard University. He is the council member in the fifth district of the city of Alhambra, and he currently serves as, ma as mayor. He also serves as a, a director of governmental relations for the Los Angeles County Medical Association. Mr. Uh, Ayala has uh, been very active in many community efforts, and he and his wife have uh, two uh, uh, children. So Mr. Ayala, I'm gonna start with you. The city of uh, Alhambra, and we're gonna talk about uh, uh, city politics, but part of the laws and the structures of city politics includes what we call at-large elections and district elections. But you guys kind of have a hybrid of a type of system that you have. Can you explain to the students and to the audience uh, how your election systems work in the uh, Alhambra? Absolutely, uh, and first of all, thank you, uh, Professor Guerra and the students for being here uh, this evening and uh, listening to us up here. But essentially, the, the structure of the elections in Alhambra is uh, an at-large election by districts. So if, you're, uh, if you put yourself on the side of the voters, uh, when I ran for office the first time, you actually had three different uh, council members to vote for, each in, every, uh, each and every, uh, in a different district. So uh, you would have uh, three choices and uh, or you'd have choices for for every single district in my case it was one three and five and uh you would choose you know your whoever you uh, you wanted to vote for uh in the first district in the second district and the third district and uh it's kind of an interesting dynamic because essentially you have to live within a certain region of the city a certain district but you still have to uh, uh basically uh campaign throughout the whole city so you can technically not get one single vote within your own district, but still get elected and represent that particular district and the rest of the city. So what's the rationale for that kind of a, uh, a system? Well, I, I kind of inherited, I wasn't part of the, uh, the, the, the system there, but essentially what I've heard is that uh, you, you as, a, as a council member are able to represent every single part, or the, the city council basically ref reflects every part of the city so, uh, for instance, the 5th District is completely on the west side of the district, uh, and so that's uh, technically being represented by me. And then you have others that present the north, the, the south, and the, uh, and the east as well. Uh, and we, we uh, recently went through some redistricting uh, because you know, part of the, um, the, the Voting Rights Act requires that if you're within a certain deviation, what that means is if you have more people in one district than another, that you ought to try to figure out how to consistently ensure that you have the same people or the same amount of, uh, of voters or residents within every, every single district. So we just adopted uh, some new districts uh, as of uh, a month or two ago. 
that uh, are more representative of the entire city uh, based on numbers, population numbers. Steve, uh, when I first met you, you were on your way to becoming a professor. You were really interesting. You were doing all this great work. What happened to you? Well, Why did you end up going into politics instead? Yes, I guess I got tired of being in the library, for real. Oh, don't say that to these guys. I guess they, they don't have well, a library like we this. do at UCLA. So After it's 10 years of school, sometimes you do get tired. But uh, no, I, I absolutely loved uh, academia. I love teaching, uh, the teaching experience. Uh, but I did confront politics at UCLA, because uh, UCLA being a public institution and being in, in the PhD program over there in history was directly impacted by the state budget. And I think when we had a first real tough downturn, uh, forced me to go out in the working world, and the working world uh, actually ended up moving its way to politics. So currently, one thing I didn't mention, I think when, when I did the introductions, I mentioned that Luis also holds the position of being Director of Governmental Affairs, and Steve also currently holds the position of being the District Director for a Senator. And, and why is that? I mean, I don't think students understand, or a lot of our audience doesn't understand, that many of these elected offices are actually part-time. So talk about even the community college district, that large, as big as it is, as important as it is, it's still a part-time position. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the majority of positions, elected positions in Los Angeles County are actually part-time positions. Uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but with the exceptions of uh, the city of Los Angeles, uh, the city of Long Beach, and I believe a handful of mayors, uh, Pasadena may be one, um, most, most cities, um, it's considered a part-time position. And uh, most of the time, your pay is actually uh, connected to uh, population, although there's quite a bit of vari you know, uh, a variety in that. Uh, but I'll use the example, and, and obviously our, all of our pays and all the compensation we get is all completely publicly disclosed, and anybody can look it up. And when we run for office, it actually stated there what you're, what you're going to do. It translates pretty low after the hours you, you put into it. It's sometimes way below uh, the state minimum wage here for the effort we put in here. But to give the example of the city of San Fernando, which population is about uh, 24,000, 25,000 people, uh, the, the base compensation for city council member was about 500 and eighty dollars a month so uh, with some small things like cell phones and car allowances and that kind of stuff but it's relatively small in the community college board of trustees it's twenty four thousand dollars a year um, so um, but the basic minimum requirements is attend your your actual meetings if you don't attend meetings you don't get paid for the meetings you don't attend uh, but there's actually quite a bit of work in between the meetings and really that kind of depends up to the approach of the elected officials some of us enjoy the work, engage in it, uh, feel that it's our responsibilities to take meetings and to learn materials and to be very involved, and it will rack up the hours here. Um, some folks, you know, they do the basic minimum and, and, uh, and it's okay, and regardless, you earn the same, in my case at the College Board, we earn the same $24,000 a year, so. But you don't do it for the money. Absolutely, it, it, you know, if, if we were to make money, this, this is not the chosen profession if, if money was the top priority of. And you have to have a, really another full-time job to be able to afford to do this. A full-time job and actually a job that provides some level of flexibility too, you know, so uh, and I'll tell you when I first started in politics, you know, I, I, I would teach and I teach at the university and it's, you know, has some level of flexibility. Uh, now, um, you know, for me, I work uh, with the California State Senate and with the senator who's also an elected official and, um, you know, uh, the schedule there, I mean, uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, don't go into politics if you think you're going to get away with 35 hours a week or 40 hours a week in terms of work week. Our weeks are way above that, and weekends, nights are very regular parts of our, of our schedule. And so, um, you know, in, in the end, you know, your, your salary, you're, you're kind of salaried, so, you know, I don't get the overtime, and most of us that do elected politics don't do that. We, you know, there's, there's, there's certainly a passion involved with it, there's a commitment we have, there's uh, an agenda sometimes we have why we get elected and what we want to do, what we want to accomplish. Uh, and of course, there's others who, get elected because, you know, you get to go to a fancy dinner every once in a while, but, uh, but you know, most of us are, are realistic and, you know, you do it because you have an agenda and you want to get something accomplished. How old were you when you got elected to the San Fernando City Council? Uh, I think I was 27 years old. 27. Yeah. Um, Francisco, unlike the other two, you are a city attorney. That means he gets paid a lot of money. Okay, do so, uh, you do it for the money. You don't, uh, <laughs> like, a, a, like a, a, a typical lawyer, he's not free. Um, and so uh, talk about how, how the type of work that you do and uh, how you become a city attorney. 
Yes, before that, though, I want to thank you, Fernando. I'll call you Fernando because there's a lot of familiarity here. I've known him for about 15, 17 years. I, usually don't, I usually don't tell people that. I know, and I've asked you repeatedly to, to you know, bring me here to talk to students, and uh, so now it's great to be here. And of course, you invite me when I had a bad haircut, but I'll just uh, go along with that. That's actually the best I've ever seen you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I represent uh, local agencies. I made a career out of it, uh, and I really enjoy it. And, uh, I get hired by cities, uh, school districts, uh, recently uh, uh, a water district. It's, um, it's a very, very Latino-based, um, client base. Uh, I think that's why they hire me. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, relation uh, to the client that I really appreciate. Uh, for me, entering into this area was quite by accident. I was involved uh, in a political campaign for a guy named Javier Becerra, who was running in 1990 for uh, state assembly. And my job was to uh, solicit the endorsements of various cities and by way of council members. And as I went from city to city, and those cities at that time were Montebello, Pico Rivera, Alhambra, uh, Monterey Park, uh, my job was to approach uh, council members and try to sell this very, what I thought was a very impressive young man. Uh, and in the course of doing that, they, they said, well, you, you'll be a great city attorney. I had no idea what that meant. Uh, I did some research and realized that... Um, but you had already graduated from Harvard Law and had already passed the bar yes, at that time. Yes, I had worked for the EPA uh, for about three years at my public service there. And um, so I, I, I found a firm that specialized in the area and I made a career out of it. And for me, it's been a very enjoyable... And what career. is the role of a city attorney for uh, cities like San Fernando or Alhambra? Yeah, the, the, the best way that I could describe it is, uh, you know, cities by, by law are corporations, and we're all familiar with, with corporate formation. Uh, and a corporation has its board of directors, uh, and so a city would have its city council. And corporations also engage, the, you'll hear about the general council. Well, that's my job. I am sort of the general council of a corporation who's, uh, who's responsible for providing services to a constituency. And in that capacity, we buy property, we sell property, we defend against lawsuits, we, we sue others. Uh, but the most enjoyable part of it for me is, is the actual governance, the, the engaging the council members and working with them as they try to implement their vision. And so to be their confident and to be their, their legal arm as they try to uh, advance their agenda. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Latino politics. I mean, you said 1990. In, in 1990, and we saw some of these er earlier graphs, there was um, 1990, like in 1989 in Huntington Park, there was only one Latino, right. but right. now there's five. Um, and, and we saw the demographic shift that has occurred in those cities. Um, what led to the increasing number of Latino elected officials, especially in cities like Huntington Park, San Fernando, et cetera? Yeah, well, um, we should do a second study as to, you know, like where have all the white folks gone? Yeah, yeah well, where did they go? Yeah, they, I, you, you I, just I, I don't know. I'm curious about that also. Uh, that's, um, the, I'm very familiar with the Southeast area. That's where I kind of made my, my career in San Gabriel also. And we witnessed the, I guess what I would consider the natural displacement, the, the mm -hmm. transition of, uh, of folks from, uh, who are Latinos, uh, Bell Gardens would be a good example, uh, uh, commerce, in areas that were traditionally uh, inhabited by, by, by whites. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that displacement comes a gradual uh, empowerment because you'll witness if you do the, the research that it, it takes a, a hell of a lot of numbers for there to be a change in the governing structure. So the, back in 1990, when I got involved, uh, the big issue was Bell Gardens. Bell Gardens was, like, I would say, like an 85% Latino community or thereabouts, and governed by, by five uh, white, I think, males. Mm -hmm. And they had appointed one Latina, Hernandez. Um, and there was a recall, and it, they, they were taken out, and they were replaced by Latinos with one exception. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's just a natural flow of uh, population. Our numbers are increasing. We have to go somewhere, and we tend to gravitate towards each other. And with that comes uh, numbers, with numbers comes power, and with power comes the ability to make changes in the governing structure. Yeah, but a Latino can represent a non-Latino community, and an Anglo can represent a non-Anglo community. Isn't that true? Yeah, I, I read that recently in, um, in the debate over the, the LA County. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I, I have very strong views about that, and uh, I think it's just a, I think it's a statement to maintain the status quo. Okay, well, let's talk to Luis Ayala who is Latino, but in his city, it's majority Asian. And so about representing, uh, 
how, how does that work where a Latino is, is in a city that's majority Asian and people talk to you about that? You just heard Francisco's thinking it's a, a way to maintain uh, a power. Did Latinos come into power and are trying to maintain power in Alhambra against Asian or what's going on there? Well, uh, to your first question, uh, representation is really about uh, delivery, delivery of services. In, uh, in the case of a council member or mayor, it's really about the delivery of municipal services to the constituent or the residents of that city. Uh, in Alhambra, uh, my focus has never been on representing the Latino constituency or representing the Asian constituency, the, you know, et cetera. It's always been about the basic municipal services. So uh, my focus has been on ensuring that the streets are clean, that uh, our parks are clean, that we continue to bring in senior uh, community centers uh, to the area, regardless of ethnicity, but keeping in mind that uh, we are very culturally diverse, and so uh, ensuring that, for instance, we have a huge uh, Chinese population, so ensuring that uh, some of those folks that can't uh, uh, read the English uh, you know, have signage in uh, Mandarin or Cantonese, and you know, it's, it's been done for, for uh, decades now for the Latino population that couldn't necessarily speak uh, English, uh, or English was their second language. Steve, um, you represent a district that's really gigantic. I mean, give so, some basic numbers, because I mean, you're, you have more people living in your district than some states have. You know? well, I'll put it like this. I, I got elected, the number of votes I got elected with was more than the total number of votes of six elected governors in this country. So picking LACCD with 130,000 votes, what, I think about a, I got about 140,000 votes or so. That's, that's more than six states out there and their governors. So and that's just, you know, that's the county of Los Angeles. It's, I, I think it's some, it floats to somewhere pieces of 36 cities. Oh, 36, okay. So, but some, some parts we have a small piece. But to give you a sense in terms of my district, we start up in Silmar and San Fernando, the north side. We go all the way down to San Pedro from the east. Uh, we don't get Santa Monica College, but we get West LA College. Uh, we'll go from a place like Camarillo, uh, Calabasas, I'm sorry, Calabasas all the way out to Montebello. So Calabasas folks would go to a Pierce College, Montebello folks may go to NELAC, uh, in East LA College. So it's a very, very, very large district. Um, and it, it's, it reflects Los Angeles, it reflects the county, reflects the city uh, in terms of demographic change. Um, and uh, 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 for me it's kind of interesting because I go from a place like San Fernando where it's, you know, 1,300 votes to get elected uh, to a place like LACCD where it's 140,000 votes to get elected. Uh, and um, there's some, some things that are common and some things that are very different. Uh, so, you know, the, the challenge too is, is uh, um, to understand essentially what your role is in terms of government, but then to also understand there, there's a certain kind of <laughs> political activism that came before me in my time uh, that, you know, happened, you know, before my parents were even in this country. Uh, that I think I end up being a part of carrying that torch forward. Now, uh, I'll say this, in the city of San Fernando, very interesting enough, in the 1980s was kind of our market shift, where we saw folks leave that city, go to places like Simi Valley, and go to the West San Fernando Valley, and go up to Santa Clarita, and, and, and those communities up there. But in that, we also saw some public policy decisions that were really bad for the city. We saw the sell-off of parkland. We saw the downsizing of government. We saw this whole thing of, I don't want to pay taxes anymore. What was left in that community were older, older folks. Uh, there were folks who didn't necessarily care as much about the park system, didn't necessarily care as much about the schools and the condition of the schools. And so the change- that's, that's not the services that they were utilizing. It was, they, they cared about their public safety, they cared about their police department. And so as we see this kind of new generation of folks coming involved, at least in San Fernando's case, a lot of us are young. You know, a lot of us were from, from uh, Cindy Montanez, who was the youngest at 20, when was she elected? You were there when she was elected. 20, 24, 25 years old, uh, you know, to some of the newer, I mean, it's in mid-20s to late 30s, it's kind of the new generation of leadership. We replaced folks with gray hair. And uh, we shifted from, you know, where public service is still important, yeah, but public safety is still important, because obviously we have, you know, neighborhoods where, where crime is an issue, and we kind of want to make sure it stays safe. But at the same time, you shift to like, you know, I'll say this, during my time, we built the first brand new park in 30 years in that city. I mean, it's 19, like, 
79 was the last time they built any park space. And, and so those kinds of changeovers and wanting to invest in commercial economic development to get this kind of experience, shopping, all, all those kinds of things mark change in values too. Demographics mark change in values. And but also talk about LA um, Community College District and the billions of dollars right. that you guys are spending. And then LA Unified District, which hadn't built a high school in over 50 years, right. has built something like uh, eight or nine of them in the last right. three or four years. Well, you know, at the community college level, we're, we're kind of in the midst of a $6 billion renovation, you know, and it started 10 years ago. Uh, before that, though, uh, there was virtually no investment, with the exception of Mission College, which was one of the newer schools out in the North Valley, and, and, and Mission College actually existed inside of bungalows until they got some significant funding. Can you imagine a community college in bungalows? Well, if you go back to East LA College, for example, that was in bungalows at one time in its history. So with the change of population, um, you know, these community colleges started playing a very key role in terms of people's opportunity, economic opportunities and uh, opportunities to, you know, whether it's transfer, whether it's getting basic skills, or whether it's doing some career technical education. Uh, uh, you know, these, these, these <coughs> colleges actually you know, became much more important again. Fees at the UCs and the CSUs and private schools all went up. You still found an affordable pathway through the community college. So the last 10 years, this board, the board that I sit with, is managing $6 billion worth of local economy and local development. So from top to bottom, if you go to any of the schools that we've worked on, uh, they're, compl they're virtually completely modernized. And on top of that, have also have some some uh, high you know standards of, of 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 principle, which is we want to make these campuses green, and so uh, LA Community College as well as LAUSD, you know we're making that reinvestment again. You know the, the, in the 1950s, both institutions were top tier across the United States. Uh, in the you know getting into the 80s, uh, it was an absolute decline. Some of that has to do with the people that were there, who was who were now the students. LA, LACCD, 50 percent of the students are Latino. 50% of the students. LA, you know, USD, and somebody can help me with those stats, but it's even significantly higher than that. Uh, 70%. 70% now. So those, you know, if you look at the numbers in the 50s, they were probably similar to the way a lot of these cities were, where it, it wasn't about Latinos. And, and as, as the white flight kind of happened, and there is movement, you can see them and track them moving out, reprioritizing investments, reprioritizing improving the campuses, building, growing, adapting to the population, all became the needs. It all became part of our causes of wanting to go out there and run and participate in government, because you got to kind of demand that these new services, that the quality of education, that the quality of the campus experience is held. I mean, I remember the first time I got involved in education politics was listening to a bunch, and this was as a UCLA student, listening to a, a bunch of kids getting pissed off about bathrooms not functioning on their campus in South LA. And it's, you know, you see that, and it's a tough thing to not want to get involved with and help. Well, here at Loyola Marymount University, every year we admit about 300 transfer students from um, uh, community colleges, and about one-sixth of those come from the LA Community College District, whether it's West LA or East LA or Pierce Harbor, et, et cetera. Um, Francisco, um, you know, Latino politics. Uh, how, when, when I think about politics in general, there is a current trend happening nationally that we pick up in the press with people talking about the, they're, they're disillusioned with elected officials. Here in the state of California, you know, there was a lot of high hopes for uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and people ended up being disillusioned about that. Certainly in, in 2008 when Obama was elected, I mean, you thought there was gonna be a whole new type of politics that was gonna emerge and yet everybody uh, from Latinos, African Americans, white progressives are all kind of disappointed about his inability to do certain things. Um, very generally, can elected officials make a difference? How, how do we know they can make a difference? Um, well, beginning with the, uh, the novelty issue, um, there is an expectation problem also as we elect our, our own and we demand uh, a lot from them. So too high of an expectation? I think that's a, an ongoing problem as we, I think we're facing it now and I think in the presidential situation. Um, as far as the, the more core question about uh, does local electeds make a difference, uh, absolutely. I mean, I grew up in, in LA County. We had no sense of governance. Uh, we didn't know where to go uh, when it came to the basic function of government. Uh, my, uh, you know, Tip O'Neill said all, all politics is local. Uh, I, I represent cities where, where constituents, residents come to the podium 
and uh, are able to vent about uh, schools primarily, which is an interesting jurisdictional problem. But they also are able to talk about the, the, the basic issues that they face every day, uh, whether it's the, the trash collection, which they pay for, or whether it's police services, which they pay a lot for. Um, and and, and I, I witness a dynamic that I think is absolutely great to see the interaction between a constituent, a person coming to governance by simply sometimes even walking and, 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 and seeing and presenting the issue and having the mayor tell the chief, chief look into it and have the chief talk to that person and resolve the problem. And I think that's the greatest um, value and benefit of having these cities and having local elected officials have a direct contact with um, Luis or Mayor Ayala or Council Member Ayala, how come, how come I can call you both may mayor and council member? Explain how, how that works, who's mayor or what, what happens. I think, Steve, you were mayor once at, you know, what does that mean to be mayor of Alham Alhambra as opposed to council member? So, so most cities, most small cities, the ones that require, like Steve and I, when, we're on, when he was on San Fernando City Council, to have full-time jobs in addition to our part-time city council job, is that we are elected as city council members either by district or at large, and then some many cities have opted to simply uh, rotate the mayorship from person to person. In, in the case of Alhambra, we rotated every nine months and did the math. Uh, what that means is that for every term, every single one of, uh, of us five council members get to serve one term as mayor. Uh, different, uh, you know, city of LA obviously has an elect uh, a mayor that's elected. It's a whole different dynamic there because of its size, New York, and others. Uh, but many small cities opt to have this uh, either the rotation by vote or automatic. And what, what it means really is that you conduct or you lead the meetings and that you're the representative technically for the city. So when there's a public event uh, or, or, you're, or they need a spokesperson, you're basically the spokesperson for the city. Uh, you don't necessarily, I mean, you can initiate policies and policy issues, uh, whether you're the mayor or a council, or you know, simply the council member for that particular time, but uh, that's the basic difference there. You get paid more? You really don't. You get to serve, uh, in, in, the, in my case, and I know that other small cities, you get to serve on some of the bigger uh, boards, such as the uh, LA County Sanitation District, which uh, is, is basically the body that, uh, cleans up a lot of the groundwater. Uh, so, some boards such as that, the mayor gets to serve automatically. But in the case of our council, and it's not the case in every city, we also appoint people to different uh, boards. There's a representative with the California League of Cities. There's a representative with the Southern California Association of Governments and on and on. Uh, so in our particular case, we, we established a system that, was, that aimed to be pretty fair to, uh, to all of the council members in terms of re their representation regardless of whether you're the mayor or, or you're not. So the mayor really has no more power than any other council member. They get to run the meeting, but very little power. It's symbolic. Right, it's more symbolic in uh, most smaller cities. Okay, so then who is the executive of the city? So the executive of the city is the, the uh, city manager. So the city manager is a full-time position. Uh, it's essentially, if you think of a corporation, it's the CEO or the executive director of the city, that person oversees, the, the city manager oversees a number of different departments. Uh, each department has a director, and those directors report directly to the city manager. The city manager technically reports to the city council. Uh, so uh, that that's really kind of the power structure, from the council, which is elected, to the city manager and the people, uh, and and then also the, uh, the different department heads uh, and those department heads can be in from uh, community development services, uh, which is, is the, uh, the director that oversees the parks and rec, the chief of police, the fire chief, among others. So um, let me ask you a political question. Every time I mention your name to somebody, they're always like, oh, yeah, the uh, council member from Alhambra, I, and I think he's going to be uh, a state legislator. Uh, so are, are you going to run for the state legislature? I'm, uh, well, the filing period for... The yes or no question. Yes, <laughs> I am. Take the yes, I am. <laughs> uh, that poses, you know, it poses, and if I may uh, expand a little bit on that, it poses an interesting question. That means question. he's going to do a campaign speech right now. <laughs> yeah. It poses an interesting uh, question with, you saw the change in demographics. The district that I, uh, I'm looking at running for, which is the 49th Assembly District, is a district that, with this whole redistricting process, 
was designated as the only majority minority uh, Asian district, which, which means that the population is about 50% uh, Asian American. And uh, voter registration is a whole different thing. But since we're talking about redistricting, I think this is a very, very good case study in uh, whether or not uh, the representation makes a difference, whether it be uh, ethnic representation by Latino or an Asian or what have you. The last uh, two representatives of this assembly district, which is about seven cities, uh, have been both uh, Asian American and actually uh, uh, both a husband and wife when the district was still predominantly Latino in terms of the voter registration. Now, an interesting question would be, have they served the Latino community as well as uh, a Latino would have uh, based on their ethnic makeup? And you know, uh, that's gonna depend on who you ask. And so the same question- What, what do they, you think? Uh, I think I think they have. I mean, here, here's the other interesting thing that. So you're well, saying that there was an Asian representative in a mostly Latino district, and they did a good job. So why can't there be a Latino representative in a mostly Asian district? Absolutely. Why can't it be reversed? Uh, and and one of the things that being post interesting enough is the issue of language. There's a, a candidate running that speaks Cantonese and and, uh, and Mandarin, and the issue is being made of, well, this person would be able to understand this constituency. But most voters, uh, I think, speak English. And the, the two representatives there in the past uh, did not speak Mandarin nor Cantonese. They actually were they spoke one language, and that was English. Uh, and so it, it's an interesting thing for you all to, to think of. And, and, I, and I've got to say that the Voting Rights Act was definitely very historical and a very necessary and important thing for, for us uh, here in California, specifically because what it did was it enabled Latinos and other ethnic minorities to get elected and, and make up a body, uh, a diverse body. Uh, but but uh, what I think that created was also open-mindedness in, in an educational process. So if we're a, a, a governing body up here and we're all Latino and we're representing the diverse community out there, we would benefit by having another person of a different ethnicity that would represent those people to kind of stir the debate. I'm the only Latino on my council, and we, the second largest group in Alhambra is Latino, and I'm the one that's basically pushing, uh, you know, whenever, whenever the ethnic uh, question comes up, I'm the one that's looked upon to really kind of give the feedback. So it's important to have representation from every ethnic population uh, at every level of government, in my opinion. Um, Steve, uh, what prompted you to run for community college board? I mean, going from a tiny city which is only 20,000 people to a city or to a district that represents four and a half billion people. That's a big leap. I mean, that's almost as big as Sarah Palin going from Wysalia to being governor of Alaska. Uh, what, what, uh, what made you think that you could take that leap and, and, and would be uh, elected? Right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. In San Fernando, actually, there's, there's a very interesting connection to the LA College Board. And that's the, in that city and in, in that activism, actually uh, spawned one of the nine campuses, uh, Mission College. Uh, Mission College, I got a chance when I took over at City Council to figure out what to do with bungalows. And I remember Francisco remember the bungalows we had and, 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 uh, and hopefully the future of those bungalows will be uh, senior housing or some quality housing for folks. But it started off in a bunch of trailer bungalows and you know it was kind of uh, peace all over the community and so when it got uh, essentially unified and, and moved up to a larger piece of property up in Somar, there was kind of like this in, intense connection with this community college and the city. It kind of went hand in hand. Um, there was a few experiences I had with sitting board of trustees, uh, just in questions about construction, questions about you know services. You know, the thing about Mission College is it didn't transfer very well. You know, it's 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 performance and connection to the local community where I was serving wasn't, wasn't, wasn't uh, the best quality that it could be. Now, I'll say this, you know, the other part of me, which is, which is interesting in this panel, the way it's comprised, um, I actually grew up in Huntington Park. You know, I spent my childhood as, a, as in the 1980s to 90s uh, in Huntington Park, and, and I remember the old white guy council member back in the day. And, uh, um, but in that community too, and I'll say this for, for my mom, uh, the first connection we ever had to education was through the satellite, um, uh, Southgate, or I'm sorry, Huntington Park, it was Huntington Park at the time, the satellite of East LA College. First, first college I ever stepped foot on was, was ELAC. Uh, 
and it was the first kind of entry point that education can mean something. My mom did her education late in life. You know, she became a nurse. She got her AA degree and her LVN uh, uh, certification out of uh, LA Trade Tech, uh, which is right right down downtown. And and so in that, I, I, it it had a market improvement for my family, for my experience, for my opportunity to go off and become. My mom was the first college graduate in our household, and that was a community college graduate. But um, to understand the connection, to have my own little kind of tussle with the district, doing some weird things or things I didn't necessarily like, you know, I came from the perspective of, you know what, if you don't like something, jump in and change it, be part of that change. And so now, you know, and, and I'll say this, with LACCD, it's amazing in a couple of ways, because if you look at that first original board, you'll see the board, although the majority white back then in 1969 when it was first comprised, used to be part of LAUSD, um, had a space for an African American and had a space for a Latino. And part of that conversation extends from the fact that there was a campus in the middle of a Mexican neighborhood, East LA, and there was a campus in the middle of an African American uh, neighborhood in, in, in South LA. Uh, and so in, in essence, uh, theoretically, I mean, the board's kind of been all over the place, and I will always contend that we, we we, we need one more Latino representation to at least kind of equalize the numbers. But having representation of all communities was, was, is an important conversation amongst the stakeholders, amongst the trustees, even the trustees, sometimes they might get squirmish if they're not that extra Latino candidate or a Latino board member, they might get a little squirmish in terms of the conversation, but they readily admit that it's important to have people that represent all parts of the neighborhood. Now I'll say this, I'm the first board of trustees to live in the Northeast San Fernando Valley on, on this board and probably the first person, or the only person that's ever lived in uh, Huntington Park. Now, I don't know where Mr. Orozco's from back in the day. No, he but, wasn't from Huntington uh, Park. But I'll tell you, he probably wasn't from Huntington Park and wasn't from San Fernando, so, uh, so there's some first in that sense, too. So, um, San Fernando's a tiny city, okay, but you have emerged and been on, now on the Community College Board. From that same city council, we have Nuri Martinez, who now sits on the Los Angeles um, School Board, which is the second largest in the nation. And also from that city council came uh, Cindy Montañez, who went to the state legislature. So it's really that city council has been pretty active in terms of sending people. Right. One of the first questions that one of my students asked me is, hey, where's the woman representation up here? How, how have Latinas done in politics? I know I just talked about those two, but in general, when you talk about Latino politics, what has been the role of um, Latinas in terms of holding office and in terms of voting and their their uh, policy issues? Well, I'll say this in San Fernando, I spent almost the majority of my time being, if you're going to talk about men, women, <laughs> being in the minority in terms of men. Um, oh, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> I was surrounded by women on, on my city council. At LACCD, um, uh, you know, it, it's actually, this is the first time in several decades that there are four men versus three women on the board. So at least in the experiences I've had. Saying that the majority of the time it's been uh, women who have been the majority women, on the. Women are very close to it. Now, now I'll, I'll say this from, from the San Fernando perspective, uh, and even to this day, I, I forget what it is. Uh, it's something like uh, three women and two men on the council still. Um, it, it, Latinas have fared very well from my experiences in, in, in my local government. They've also fared fairly well in terms of LUSD. You know, I have my former colleague, Nuri, and then there's also Monica Garcia, who, uh, who are the two Latinas serving on LUSD. Um, at the community college level, I mean, we can look back, and although, you know, Sylvia Scott Hayes had just retired, she had a long tenure there, and she came in behind Gloria Romero, who had, had a, you know, a, a long career in the legislature, too. So, um, you know, we've had a fair amount of representation, at least in the space that I've come from. Now, the difference is, is in the San Fernando Valley, looking around at all the other elected posts, uh, other than Cindy uh, Montañez, who had her, her four years in the assembly, most of the other positions, supervisor, or the other assembly uh, spots, uh, supervisor, city council, uh, Congress, uh, I mean, she's the only Latina, really, that's kind of made her way uh, above local government and, and uh, school board or, or college board. Francisco, there's a stereotype about Latino males and Latino male voters uh, being macho and less likely to support female candidates than the white community where they support many more uh, female um, candidates. Has that been your experience? Uh, no, actually, uh, and I want to have an example of, uh, of this issue because right now there is a, a debate as to where an assembly member is going to run given the redistricting. And uh, Ricardo Lara uh, represents an area where I do a lot of work and I believe he's going to be shipped. 
run to an adjacent district. And uh, his comment to a few of us was, uh, uh, well, when that happens, uh, many folks get in play, because now they see an empty seat will be supporting Maria Santillan. Uh, and the basis for it is because he that we, don't, we do not have enough Latinas in the state legislature. And that we've seen a decline, actually, of Latinas. So uh, I've witnessed uh, Latino uh, electeds at that level, at the state level, uh, go out to identify a, a Latino or behind them. So when you take a look at elected officials and you just compare white elected officials, Latino elected officials, and black elected officials, women have actually done better within the Latino community and black community at very important positions of power. So for instance, uh, right now there are seven uh, Latino members of Congress from the state of California. Of the seven, five are women. Uh, right now there are four African American uh, from the state of California in Congress. All four are women. Um, when you take a look at the um, state Senate, let's say four or five years ago when there were 10 Latinos in the state Senate, five of them were uh, women. And so the idea that um, women are discriminated against to a much greater degree in minority communities, um, there may be some of that in certain areas. But in certainly when it comes to holding significant political office, Latinas do better than white women do, comparatively speaking, and black women do better than white women do, comparatively speaking, when you take a look at Southern California and significant positions. Though there's still an underrepresentation of women in local city councils if you always assume that half the population is uh, a women. And actually, when you take a look at registered voters, uh, black women are a higher percentage than black men, and Latinas are a little bit higher percentage than, than Latinos. So if you just went by registered voters, there should be more Latinas in, in elective office. And so when we take a look at all these city councils, there's still more Latinos. But when you get to the higher, more important positions, it's Latinas who uh, do a, 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 lot, a lot better uh, 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 job. Now, when I give you that data, what, what's your reaction? What do you think that, that's the case, Steve? I, you know, there's actually one additional component to the higher level, and that really got, you have to take into account, and that's term limits. And I think, you know, since California enacted term limits, um, it, you know, it, in the initial opening, um, I think we did see a lot of diversity uh, in terms of male-female, uh, in terms of obviously, um, you know, Latino, African American. African American, it, it's obviously a because of changing demographics, it's a tougher question in, in some parts of the city. There's a lot of blend city, you know, like we'll, we'll talk LA City Council uh, and even the assembly seat that overlooks South LA. South LA uh, is not an African American community anymore. I mean, it's, you know, 70% Latino, but the majority of voters are African American. Now, the term limit question of where you're constantly seeing turnover is getting us into certain positions where you, you know, you, you, it's replenishing the bench which seems to be uh, a little more difficult. Now in Congress, you don't have term limits. So I think we've seen you know, Latinas and, and, and black women have a very strong, stable presence. And, and they actually, some of the, some of, they represent some of the larger than life figures you know, uh, on the board, you know, uh, or in, in one sense you like, get over, uh, Maxine like Waters, Maxine Waters, who represents absolutely. LMU, by the way. Does she? Yeah, she comes all the way over this. Yeah, absolute dean of, of, of the Congresswoman. Um, Karen Bass, who comes from being the former Speaker of the Assembly. Um, you know, very, very strong, pre the Loretta and Linda Sanchez, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, Latinos, uh, Roy Ball. Uh, so there's some kind of interesting, but they don't have term limits. Now, on the Assembly side of things, you know, we see some folks who had really strong runs, very prominent runs, uh, from a Romero, uh, uh, across the board where you have some, you know, Liz Figueroa at one time in Northern California and Deborah Ortiz who, you know, were, were absolute, you know, uh, 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 sensational senators during their time. Um, but they, up, they come up to the term limit question. And the term limit question was very uh, interesting in terms of getting those doors finally open, unseating some of these folks who'd been there generations. But now the next question is, is how quickly are we turning over in the institution? How quickly is that institutional knowledge being lost in the capacity to regenerate, you know, uh, uh, you know, if, th if that capacity still exists. And that, that's kind of a big question that we're all struggling with. We see it every year, and all you gotta do is turn on the TV during budget time up there, and you see how much we struggle up there because there's a lot of loss of institutional knowledge. Um, and that's just uh, one of those kind of travesties or after impacts of, of uh, term limits. Yeah, I'm gonna let some of the students ask questions. If you wanna ask a question, just come up. We have a mic right here. Um, so if you uh, are interested in doing that, but I'm gonna ask you one other question. We're talking about redistricting. So 
in the, oh, by the way, if you ask a question, you get extra credit in uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Rodriguez Gibson's class and in my class, so. Uh, and if you don't ask a question, um, I think some of you need extra credit, by the way, when I start thinking about <laughs> it, so. Um, in, in 2000, we did the uh, census. So every 10 years, a census is conducted, and then we go through apportionment. That means where the Congress reapport or, or gives different states more congressional seats or what have you, which leads to redistricting. And then that takes place in the first election immediately after the census, which is in 2002 or, or 2012, which is what's gonna happen. And we see that, and we've noticed that there's a high correlation with redistricting and the election of African Americans and Latinos. Because what happens is the lines catch up to the demographics and they change it. They have to take into consideration, which many of you have mentioned, the Voting Rights Act, which says you cannot uh, discriminate against uh, minority communities and fracture them, et cetera. Um, but it also, it's not only Congress that gets reapportioned and redistricted, it's also the state legislature and then the, all the counties in, the, in California, all 58 counties have districts, okay? But most cities actually don't have districts, they're at large. In Los Angeles County, Los Angeles City, uh, Long Beach, Pasadena, Pomona, Alhambra, Downey, and Redondo Beach, it's kind of a weird collection. All those cities have districts and have to go through redistricting, and Mayor Ayala talked about that, they've already done that in Alhambra. And, and, we've, and I've mentioned that redistricting tends to lead to more um, Latino or African American representation. Uh, Francisco and then Steve and then Luis will go down the line and talk about if many of these cities like Huntington Park and San Fernando had districts earlier on, would that have made a difference? Would Latinos have been elected to faster or, or would different people have been elected? What, what difference would districts have made in many of these cities? Uh, Francisco? You know, when, I, when you called on me, I, I, I gave some thought to districting, or districting, if you, if you start from the very beginning. And, and uh, it, 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 it challenges um, just certain notions of governance. And, uh, I, and we brought it up, we, we talk about it, we have to, I think, confront it. Um, one of the basic issues that comes up is, um, can you, uh, you know, a white woman govern a um, a district that is comprised of Latinos and African Americans. And uh, I would suppose you can, given that you go to LMU. Uh, but, but, that's not a, <laughs> but that's not just a theoretical question. We have many cases where there are yeah. white women who represent yeah. majority Latino districts, and we have some cases where Latinos represent majority it, white true. districts. And, and so I think that what we need to think through as we talk about redistricting, that, that redistricting really has been the politics of exclusion, that, that, that it's, it's been used systematically and historically to exclude uh, the opportunity for a Latino to represent a district. And we all have to acknowledge to some degree, at least in the Latino community, we tend to vote for our own. And so when I look at redistricting, uh, I look at it from the standpoint as to, is anything going on that's diluting or that's, that's creating divisions in the community of Latino? Um, where they would otherwise be able to stand together and have the opportunity uh, to elect another Latino. Uh, so so that, that's how I, I see the, the redistricting. Yeah, I'm going to take a little bit of exception to what you say. I, I, I think that redistricting is not about electing Latinos or blacks. It's about giving the Latino community the opportunity to elect whoever they want, whether it's a white, a Latino, a black, or what have you but that the Latino community gets to choose, or the black community, or if it's a white community in terms of a, 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 a community of interest that we put together, that because they share an interest, let's say the South Bay cities here in Los Angeles County, which are mostly white, that they should have a right together, because they're very similar, the big beach cities, to elect someone who represents them. And, not, and it could be an African-American. The mayor of Manhattan Beach is African-American. The mayor of uh, Redondo Beach is Asian-American. And so those communities uh, do have the uh, ability to choose someone other than what the community is made up of. Steve, what do you think about what I'm saying? You know, I, I think a lot of it kind of speaks to this Remember, this is my class, not his, so you have to agree <laughs> with me. <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of it speaks to this, this issue of uh, polarized voting. You know, whether well, explain people, what that means. Well, you know, pol polarized voting is, uh, and, I, and I'll try to explain it not in specific terms, but in general terms, is 
it, like if we took this room of, of folks, um, is, is there, and in, in, if we're black, Latino, and white, if every time we took a, a, a poll, or every time we took, made an election, that you would end up having the same person elected over and over and over and over and over again, uh, with no chance, regardless of the quality of the candidates or the quality of the presentation or whatever, to have a change there, that they're so set on doing it. Now, I add another feature to it, that the reason why they're set on it is because of the person's ethnicity or the color of their skin that they choose to vote a certain direction over and over again. Now, I'll tell you, in Los Angeles, which is interesting, and, uh, and obviously one of the aspects of, of, of uh, the county conversation is they always used uh, a handful of elected officials to demonstrate that there isn't polarized voting. One of them is Antonio Veragosa. Antonio was elected throughout the city of Los Angeles, and the city of Los Angeles, I, I forget, it, I think it popped above being a majority Latino city now, but he's a mayor, and it just proves the city of Los Angeles can elect a Latino as mayor. John Noguez, who is a Huntington Park uh, person and a friend of, of all of ours up here, uh, was elected. Uh, he's, he's not my friend. Well, maybe not Fernando. So <laughs> for good reason. If you're probably. listening, John, that's not true. It was a joke. <laughs> John, <laughs> John Noguez is, is, is an openly gay Latino from Huntington Park. Wait a minute, he can't be gay because Latinos aren't gay, right? <laughs> oh, okay. And, and he gets elected. I, I, that's what my dad told me, this. <laughs> oh. uh, that's why he's not your friend, huh? <laughs> uh -huh. Uh, but John is, John is elected essentially countywide. And he was elected with other Latinos in the race. He was elected with Asians in the race. I don't know if there was any African Americans so, in the race. But you're saying that the argument is that there isn't polarized voting because Antonio Villaraigosa won. Do you, believe, do you believe that? Now, I'll say this. Um, Antonio Villaraigosa won, but he couldn't win again today. No, but that's, have very that's, hard that's time. a different and, story because... And, and here, because, let me add to this. They're actually... The, the great thing about Antonio Villaraigosa is we get a chance to look at it in, in, in two election periods. You can actually separate data and see where he had a tremendous... You know, in communities that were basically white, that had tremendous outpouring towards him. Mm -hmm. and, but then you'd take, like, let's say, for example, the West San Fernando Valley. He, he, I think he, in the first election, just barely peaked above it to win. Yeah. So I'm talking like a Chatsworth, I'm talking Porter Ranch, I'm talking Northridge. Just peaked above it to win. Then you go to Studio City, and Studio City, you know, he wins with the landslide. You know, so in, in those two cases, like, you know, can a Latino ever represent you know, Porter Ranch, Northridge, I think it'd take, it'd be very, very tough to have a, you know, represent So this is there. the argument that... But can they represent other parts of the city? Maybe. Right. So this is the argument that Supervisor Sevier Slavsky was using yes. during the recent debate about redistricting, saying we don't have to draw another Latino seat because, look, Latinos are, are winning countywide, Sheriff Baca, Juan Nogues, and, and Antonio Villaraigosa, and, and they couldn't win in it, any district, okay? Right. Uh, and, and actually, the, the best example would be President Obama. President Obama. Okay? Absolutely. But the counter argument to this, and, and I think he's misreading the data, right. and the counter argument to this is uh, Obama would have lost the election if only whites were voting. Right. Antonio Villaraigosa would not be mayor today if only whites were voting. The majority of whites did not support Antonio. The majority of whites did not support Obama. And you can go down the line. And so that it's... There's a, there's a certain bit of history to it, too. Um, you know, take the Board of Supervisors. Essentially, we, we have one Latino, Latina, on the board, but that seat would never have existed if it wasn't for litigation, if it wasn't right. for a lawsuit, if it wasn't for a specific challenge to go out and do it and make the seat. So although, you know, you can have instances like a John Noguez, you can have instances like an Antonio Villarosa, you also have the majority of our instances looking like Gordon Molina, looking like at Roy Balls in his first challenges, it looking like those kinds of instances. So I, I think you know this conversation about redistricting is very important. I, you know, and I, and, I, and I do agree with you, Fernando, in terms of I mean, you you want to put people in a position where the lines don't make the decisions for them, that they make the decisions for themselves. And in 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 some cases, I mean, it could be that a person that represents them could be an African American, or could be white, or could be Asian that does a great job. You know, I used the example of Judy Chu. Uh, who, who Luis mentioned a little while ago, she ran in, in essentially what's considered a Latino congressional seat and won it against a Latino who has a, a great career and a great track record being very progressive on things. Very different Latino communities that he's represented over his time, 
Uh, but essentially, she's gone out there and, and done that. Now, the other thing about Judy Chu, and, and this is important to keep into account for certain candidates, she's got a history in civil rights. She's got a history in being involved, um, you know, with from being a, a professor over at ELAC, you know, uh, to being involved in civil rights issues, and those are the things that she used to connect to the community there. Now, it's not always perfect, but again, the lines gave the people, didn't, didn't force people one way or the other. They, they gave them an opportunity to evaluate the candidates and choose what they felt most comfortable with. Luis, when you see the students out here thinking about this and maybe the audience and they're like, man, why do we have to talk about Latino politics, black politics, ethnic politics? Why can't we all just be Americans? Why can't we all be Californians or Angelinos? Why does race have to enter this? Does, does race matter? The, um, how, how do you handle the question about, you know, should ethnicity and race be a factor in politics? It, absol it absolutely should. Uh, it shouldn't be the only factor. But it definitely should be, and, and you're all going to be actually uh, facing that. Quite well, the question's already based. The, the governor right now, uh, as we speak, has a bill in front of him that he would sign to overturn uh, Proposition 209, which uh, many of you may remember. Affirmative action. Affirmative action was a debate that uh, you know was live and well during my time in college, and was very involved in. And you may not know about it too much now, but it's 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 bringing a Essentially, whenever you're being admitted to university or college, your ethnicity is being taken to, into account. And I'm not going to get started on that one, but that, that's one very uh, good reality that is present right now. But going to your earlier question, I, I think absolutely uh, the situation would not be what it is today in terms of electing uh, the number of uh, Latinos and other ethnic minorities had it not been for the Voting Rights Act. Uh, I think it was definitely, definitely, definitely uh, necessary, uh, just like affirmative action was, because you know there, there's um, uh, there's discussion about ethnicity, 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 but we don't often keep into account that the fact that uh, there's also a socioeconomic disparity is really what 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 uh, distinguishes one group for the other. Uh, I mean, there's so many differences even amongst Latinos in terms of generation and wealth. That that in itself, uh, you know, is a discussion, but I think the general sense that we all need to keep in mind here is that, in addition to ethnicity, which I think brings cultural relevance to the discussion table, uh, you also got to keep socioeconomic uh, uh, upbringing. You got to keep a regional perspective. I, I actually grew up in a rural town uh, north of here, Salinas. Think uh, for a while, thought very differently than uh, some of you urban folk. Uh, out here, I mean, my parents were farm workers, uh, a completely different labor than uh, even the, some of the uh, most extensive ser uh, services out here uh, uh, in, in LA County. And just the overall perspective of growing up. I grew up going to Mexico every single uh, year uh, for the summer and for, for Christmas, so it was very fluent. My first language was Spanish. I think that in itself gives a perspective, and, it, and since we are in a, in a, in a, in a uh, hist what is this, political science class? Political science, Chicano and, and studies. And I did do my master's at Harvard. I actually did a, a research back in the day on the generational differences between ethnic minorities. You know, we looked at the Japanese folks, and we looked at the uh, Mexican-American folks in California, and we looked at the differences in uh, generations from uh, first generation, uh, where, you're the, where you see your parents' struggles, where you're like the second and third generation, and you grew up maybe with a parent that you know, is more middle class or even upper class, and the differences are, are outstanding. There's what this, there's what they call sometimes this cycle, where you know, like in my case with my kids, uh, and we're going to try very hard to prevent this from happening. But even though uh, we did name our daughter after uh, a Nahuatl, uh, you know, goddess or what have you, uh, total, to chi total the, Chicano middle class. Yeah, like. Chicano. But the fact is that. I'm able to give her, uh, you know, thanks to God's blessing, I'm able to provide for her, you know, in a very different way than my parents were able to provide for me. And so that, I think, will provide a different perspective just in the general thinking. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I would just, um, I would leave with this, uh, that uh, you got to keep so many things in perspective. And I think that's, that's part of this whole affirmative action debate. That's part of this redistricting debate. It's really about electing a person that's going to be that's going to be diverse and, and, and more than just ethnicity. Obviously, the the the, the people's color of the skin it matters, 
and they're growing up, but there's a lot of other factors that should be considered as well. And I think we as uh, kind of the new generation, well, actually you guys are eh, about 10, 15 years younger now than I am. Uh, you know, we think, I, I hope at least that we think differently because we've grown up, especially here in LA County, with so much diversity. If you go to another part of California, then you don't get that same kind of diversity, but that in itself, I think, teaches you uh, many things and different perspectives. And hopefully, uh, many of you are taking a second language, not necessarily Spanish, you know, it could be uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese, or any of the others, because- Or not what. Yeah, or not what, not what, exactly. <laughs> Hey, so one of the reasons I asked you guys was because you're very comfortable about being elected officials and Latinos. I mean, we had Luis Marquez who didn't show up, but he's a Chicano studies major. And I know Steve has uh, um, done a lot of stuff in Chicano studies, and Luis, you've done some work in terms of your masters, and of course you're like Mr. Chicano um, amongst the, uh, um, uh, the Latinos. So let me ask you one last question before I turn it over to students. Let me give you a hypothetical. Let me say you're a Chicano studies major here at LMU, and you kind of radical and you get involved and maybe even try to like unionize workers and all that kind of stuff and, and you think you're, you're doing the right thing and then you you know you graduate and you let's say you live in just randomly Pico Rivera and you decide that you're going to uh, run for city council um, as a true Chicano activist is it really the way to go to run for a city council to do that or are you just gonna have to be buy into the system and you as city attorney telling them no you can't do that and calm down and stuff like that what, what would you recommend to to a true Chicano studies activist who wants to be politically involved beyond their years at, at, at LMU yeah I'm talking to you oh, okay I thought you were addressing it to the, the elected uh, no, I'm going to start with you, and I'll then make, I'll make note that, uh, that I guess I'm older than. There was a note about the just, gray hair, and just a little that bit. of myself. Um, it's younger though. And then uh, uh, I mean I'm 51. I, I know that you're all surprised that I don't look that old, but thank you. Uh, uh, but uh, and I, it's 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 great to be in school. It's great to to take those issues and and, and fight for them. We we all fought for them in our respective universities. Uh, there is an, an element of idealism that, that I think it, it's great at, at, at that age. In my case, it was in the uh, late 70s and early 80s when I was in college. Uh, and, and, and there will be a, a change. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I have it. I have, I'm the guy that, that doesn't live in Pico Rivera, though. No, but I, I know where you live, and look at the way you're dressed. And, and, I can't help and you went to Harvard, and I know the car you drive. Have you sold out? Uh, that, that, you know, that, I, I think I may have. I'm not sure. I, I, it's, it's, it's a morning question. As I, you know, take a shower. Um, no, I think it's great that that. <laughs> that um, it's a simple yes or no question. Have you sold out? I, no, I have not sold okay. out. Okay. Absolutely not. Um, as 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 we witness, and uh, in my career, I've seen incoming uh, council members that are very young and very impulsive and straight out of college and I've seen uh, very seasoned council members and um, I think that that the radicalism uh, really doesn't work I think the constituents uh, tend to be more conservative in nature I think the voting constituents you know, we have a constituency that's this large and uh, but uh, the voters Huntington Park is a city of about 65,000 people counted it takes 1,200 votes to get elected. You, um, that's more than it takes to get elected ASLMU president. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so to answer your question, I think that, uh, that, 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 that there is a, a, and I've seen it, and you can probably address it better than I can, I've seen the need to cater to the voting bloc because they're the ones that are gonna vote for you to get you elected. And I've seen folks, I've seen folks compromise. I've seen one very notable person, I won't name him, compromise on the death penalty which is a big issue for me. I'm very anti-death penalty. And uh, I knew he was against it, but uh, his constituents at that time, and it was at a time in, in, the, in the 90s where the death penalty was a big issue. And he took it on, and, 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 and we did the mailer pro-death penalty because we knew that if they were using it against us. So there is a lot of compromising here and there, but uh, I never been in that position. I, I decided about 10 years ago that I was not gonna run, and I leave it up to those who have run. Hey, so Steve, same question. Have you sold out? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't think so. You, you don't think so? Okay, Julia. <laughs> Is that a yes no, or a no? You know, no, I, it's a, I'll tell you. I, 
I, I'm, I'm, I firmly take my, my job and my responsibilities and the reason why I get elected. I have you know, a real agenda and things I want to get accomplished. You know, I'll say this, in, in, in San Fernando City Council, I don't think you could get elected if you weren't like crazy radical Chicano, you know? I mean, it's, it's uh, I'm looking at the list here and I think, and not including me, and it's obvious, not me. Uh, there's like three hunger strikers here. There's like uh, uh, couple, about, couple uh, a couple of Cindy uh, chaining herself to a tree at <laughs> you know, UCLA. I mean, no, that was not UCLA, that was her first year on city council, oh, you know? Wow. I mean, so it's you. I mean, no, I mean, literally, uh, there's a, a drummer from Danzantes for uh, Aztec dancers on the on the council that I served with at one time, Chicano studies professor at CSUN. Uh, guy, you know, I think Nuri went on a hunger strike at one time in her life, or but it was workers' issues. So, I mean, th that that council in that place in that time, you know, the social activism was very important and is very keen. You know, at the college board, uh, you know, uh, um, what can I say about my colleagues? Uh, I got some uh, oatmeal granola folks, you know, that love the environment, love the community, um, you know, truly activist uh, folks. Uh, you know, uh, a colleague of mine there, we, we were at UCLA virtually the same time, and I remember him with long hair and, you know, and running around, you know, the campus hall doing uh, Proposition 209, you know, uh, and we were around the same time. So, uh, but I'll tell you, where I grew up in and where I kind of cut my teeth and the things that I, you know, that I became involved with, and this was kind of like what's your agenda moving forward, is, um, is immigration politics. You know, um, you know the, the, as civil rights was the issue of the 60s and 70s, you know, in the 90s and the early part of this decade is, and in today t still, um, it, it's about uh, treat, treating immigrants with respect. You know, um, when some of these folks were elected, you know, my family had no part of this country yet. They came here and looked for, to be treated fairly, looked to be treated with respect. They've made a life. They, they've contributed positively to, uh, to, uh, to this community. Uh, they're all upstanding folks. I would say my, my mom and dad, both immigrants. And, you know, my uh, younger sister is a teacher at LAUSD. You know, I, I do what I do. And uh, my older sister is a, is a law enforcement officer. Ah, officer. So they were both much more successful oh, than you? Yeah, absolutely more <laughs> successful. Absolutely more successful. And, uh, but they're all public servants. Yeah. They, all serve, uh, they all serve this country. And they all serve people. And, um, and that comes from the product of, you know, two immigrants. Yeah. What I'm going to ask, though, is for all of you down the row in about one sentence, what has been the most difficult challenge, obstacle, or issue you faced as a political leader of a minority city, the majority, like majority being minority city. Francisco, the most difficult, challenging decision you had to make as a city attorney for many of these cities? Generally, the most difficult uh, issues that I confront are, uh, are council members uh, occasionally uh, compromising uh, a community or something that they want that's, that's personal. Because these are... But it's a policy question for them, and you can't tell them, right. you, you, you just tell them, I wouldn't do that if I were you, or what do you, how, what do you say? Because uh, talk to the students about closed session and what you can do there. Uh, part of the governance is our ability to to go into closed session and have a discussion just with uh, the council members. It, usually it's when it's a litigation matter or, or a personnel matter. Um, uh, it, a lot of the conversations that, that, are, that are difficult, in, in, in my opinion, with uh, this client base is that when you have five council members and they tend to pull in different directions at times. Uh, but um, the greatest difficulty for me has been when when I, I see an issue that impacts Latinos negatively, and my world is very Latino, I've probably gauged that already, um, and, 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 and it doesn't seem to matter. And, and, and to stay within my role, because my role is to be a legal advisor, period. And I've been accused occasionally of being the sixth council member. Uh, but uh, but I, I believe in, in, in the governance issue and in constituent service so much that I sometimes kind of overstep it. Yeah, Steve and Luis, let me ask you the question this way. What is the toughest vote you've ever taken, number one, and what's the vote that you regret and wish you could change? Um, that's a tough question. I, you know, I, I don't know if it's, I don't know if I'd say a vote, I'd say a position. Okay. 
and, and coming from San Fernando, and I've already, you guys get the impression that we're, we're a fairly progressive Latino uh, city. I had a colleague of mine, and I think, I'll leave him nameless, and some of you will know who exactly who he is, uh, who was on a, had a cause where he wanted to um, build, you know, and, and dedicate all these things to Cesar Chavez. Now we built what's considered one of the largest public monuments to Cesar Chavez in the nation. Uh, but he also had an effort where he wanted to name a street, an elementary school, a junior high, a library, a high school, a park, and it was his plan. He wanted to change the, the name town. of the yeah. city to <laughs> Chavezville, of course. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's what some of our responses were. Um, hey, but, what's, what's wrong with that, though? But they, so they, they changed the name of a park. Uh, to, we, have a, we have the monument, so it's the Sister Chavez Monument right next to uh, now the Sister Chavez Park what used to be San Fernando Park. And um, when I took office, it was kind of one of these, well, I didn't take office when I became the mayor and the majority kind of shifted around. You know, I just kind of took this attitude of like, we didn't have a whole bunch of money. I wanted to preserve our workforce. I didn't want to lay anybody off. And you know, there was a lot of like empty promises over, over commitments um, where, you know, the park was n named Cesar Chavez on paper, but there was never a sign change. You look up Google and it's like, this is San Fernando Park. And I'm just like, let's just go back to, you know, whatever the sign is, that's what we're going back to, period. And I remember I had a whole full room of people coming in saying, you know, you're anti this and anti that. And I'm like, you know what, I, I, I'll tell you what. And, and then I had people come up and say, you should lay off people. You should furlough them. And, you know, it got down to the point of like, where, where when it comes to labor and it comes to the workers of the city, you know, because it was a small city, I knew who at the bottom of the list was. I knew if we made that change, it was this person who was impacted this way. And I remember that the, the last, the newest guy, the last guy on the list is the newest guy. Um, and I remember him, um, just seeing him, he was one of these guys who did park maintenance and cut the grass and stuff. And his wife had gotten laid off from LAUSD because they were doing tremendous cuts. And I'm sitting here knowing that I'm gonna do everything possible because this is a real family, this is a real person, and I gotta protect this and defend this. But in the, in, so I took the position, I'm gonna be practical. If we have money in the future, we can name whatever, whatever. But we're going to stand here, and even if it's against us or Chavez, so you know, I got, I think I got a, a letter from from uh, Helen Chavez. I got letters from all kinds of folks, and I would actually, you know, I just took the time, I called them all back. When Dolores Huerta comes to you and says, "What are you doing?" I was like, I, "Let me explain to you what I'm doing." It's not easy. In oh, that you sense. said you said no to Dolores Huerta. I said no. I've never done that. I said I told Dolores, I, you know, I can't lay I can't lay them off. And, and I, I took the perspective, and I and I said I, I sat back, I thought deeply about it, and I said, "What was Cesar Chavez do?" You know, you see the wristbands, what would Jesus do? In this case, I, in our town, it's what was Cesar do, right? And so I took the perspective that that's, that's the stand. So, um, so that, that I, I think I'm very comfortable because still to this day, I think this, this year, I mean, budgets have been very tough for the city governments, but, um, but I think we've been able to, like, sustain workforce. Well, that was your toughest position. Toughest position. Do you, any vote that you regret or position? I do. Um, and, and it's another one of those where we have this, you know, tremendous aquatic center. And it was a cost vote. And, you know, and, and, I, and I remember I spoke up because I had a question about how much cost. And you know, it's part of the reason why we get into these predicaments with, 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 with our budgets and monies is because you know, every once in a while you get a council member saying, you know, I want to first class this or that. I want to be as good as anybody else. I want to spend money this way or personal causes and kind of, kind of what Francisco alluded to. And I think deep down, part of me, yeah, I wanted this really great facility for the community and the kids and I thought you know I thought the community deserved it you know uh, as much as any community did but then also part of me was trying to be practical saying I think it might be too much and in the few times I spoke up we were in the middle of a war and the council wasn't getting along and and so you know I backed off and I regret um, just going with the flow making the vote and it's a, it's a beautiful pool it's a beautiful pool but it's only open three months a year now which is a really big show, three months, nine months, something like that. It goes back and forth. But this is a you know twelve month facility, so I would have rather taken the perspective, which was, let's get nice and simple, let's keep it open year round because the programs, and the everyday way you connect to people is what's really more valuable. So. Luis, uh, your hardest vote and the vote you regret. I'll uh, I'll weave your question in with the question that was asked earlier about how do we make change or what can we do to make change, and that is that public involvement is very important. I'll use these two examples. One, the one that resulted to my favor and one that didn't. Uh, very similar to your case, we had a case where there's a very old senior citizen center in the city 
that definitely needed to be built up. We uh, had a project uh, in the line where, you know, pretty much fully funded that would have brought in a, a state-of-the-art swimming pool, state-of-the-art gymnasium, state-of-the-art uh, condos for seniors. We had to turn that down because uh, uh, there was an attorney out there that organized about 250, 300 people against it. Uh, it turns out that he lived behind the, the property and didn't want you know more people around. What? Old people are quiet, man. That's what I was saying. <laughs> but uh, long story short, with these 300 people that showed up, we had to have, hold a special meeting. Essentially, uh, we couldn't vote for it because you know it was a significant amount of people and influential folks, residents, that voted that really could have jeopardized our re-election to, to that council. And so we, we, we uh, got elected by the people, and you know, in that case, we had to go with the people. And on the opposite side, uh, we also had, I had a little bit of a struggle where I was trying to get our parks to become smoke-free in the city. And uh, there were at least two or three uh, council members that were uh, not buying it. And so what I did was you mean I- they were smokers? They were either smokers or just didn't think it was enforceable. I mean, that was kind of the thing is, you know, if, if we're gonna enforce smoking at parks or not, no smoking, then we might as well ban barbecuing. That's some of the, some of the comments that were said. But uh, essentially what, uh, what ended up happening is that uh, I partnered with uh, some of the community folks in, in the city and uh, about uh, you know, 200 people showed up with uh, cigarette buds and the whole thing. And, you know, the people spoke and, uh, you know, the, the council voted in favor of this ordinance. Yeah. So it's very important to get involved. Yeah. Next question. Hi, my name is uh, Stephanie Troncoso. And I just, uh, well, uh, in my Chicano Studies class, we just recently read about the redistricting. So I just had a question about that. And I was just wondering uh, uh, when you when it is that you first heard about the redistricting, specifically in your uh, the areas where you grew up in or where you worked, and um, uh, what was your like initial reaction to that? Yeah, why don't we talk about uh, redistricting and the state <laughs> legislature? Like, it's been completely people who represented San Fernando and or um, uh, Huntington Park, you have big difference. You already talked about Ricardo Lara, but also in San Fernando, there's the creation really of the first Latino congressional, congressional seat. seat. Well, when you saw that, what was your reaction? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, in in the Valley, there, you know, we, you know, we have a group of um, elected folks who are very close and went to high school, kind of share very common bounds, and but we had a county board of supervisor, which actually I think represents this side of town. Or, yeah. Yeah. No, he actually he just comes just up north just of north of us. We, so we're from, with the Incanabis district. From San Fernando to Santa Monica, the district went. Uh, and uh, we had uh, a Congress member who had essentially been in Congress since the early 1980s. Now, Howard Berman. Howard Berman has you know, a, a great track record actually representing Latino issues uh, and was always very good for, for me as a council member. Um, but you, know, you have this question of like, well, can there ever be a Latino representing there? So 2000 went by, and redistricting was a little different in 2000 than it was in 2010. Uh, and 2000 went by, and I, and I know that the candidate um, uh, who's, who's put his name in the hat, Tony Cardenas, um, you know, in the mid-decade you know, decade was also you know, interested in running for Congress, too, back then. He had always kind of had this interest. Uh, but the numbers were moved. There was some, a lot of tussling, a lot of fighting. You know, I think I remember San Fernando out of Berman's district, San Fernando back in Berman's district, and that was the back and forth now. Now, this time around, it was a little, it was just the Citizens Commission put us out there, put the seat out there, really didn't change it that much. And I know as soon as the first renditions of the seat went up, I think there was like a press release from Tony Cardenas, like 10 minutes later, I'm running. You know, and it was, uh, he was out there and he's running and, and um, it, it, you know, feels like for once, we're gonna have a, a Latino Congress member and somebody that comes from the local high school, somebody that comes up from the local neighborhoods, represented you know, the community for a lot of years. The question is, is how does he get to DC? Uh, what is he armed with? Who is he gonna be working with? What kind of political person is he gonna be? Um, and I think th there's another level to uh, elected politics and redistricting that changes too. It, it's kind of like the spectrum of progressive versus conservative, because you get that a lot. You know, in, in communities that, that, that I've lived in and that I've represented, it's a very progressive expectation 
that you know you get out there and you're doing very progressive politics. You know some of the things we've done on city council, even some of the things we do at the college board, are, are things that people are like, wow, you're doing that. It's and that's that's kind of the expectation of where we go. Now our representatives sometimes are different than that. You know, um, I would say I probably stand left of Tony, um, but then in Congress, Tony actually may be left of a lot of people. Uh, and, and so I, I think for, for once, for the first time having, you know, I, I do remember growing up first having Gloria Molina become my supervisor. And now having, you know, essentially the opportunity, whether it's Tony or whoever else jumps in the race, um, but to have a Latino finally representing me in Congress, it seems kind of, you know, it, it, it's, it feels like there's some progress and some movement. And I certainly hope the issues that he espouses, because Howard Berman is one who t took up farm worker issues, yeah. took up, you know, he, he actually was the author of a Dream Act, an original version of the Dream Act years ago. And this is my congressman. I was always proud of the fact that he would do that. And I was always proud that he would come into my town and work with us. But I would expect Tony, and I know he does a lot of stuff with, with, uh, with criminal justice, with youth, with all those kinds of things he's put forward, that if he can embrace those and move forward in an agenda that's, you know, really representative of the community, and, the, and that's exciting. I think it's exciting to see that happen in, in my lifetime. Luis, when you saw the new lines where Al Alhambra was, what was your reaction? Holy smokes. No, I just <laughs> actually, uh, it, it was kind of predictable. I, I think there was a big push by a lot of community organizations, uh, Common Cause and some of the Asian American uh, groups out there uh, working with MALDEF uh, to, for, for a number of years now to make this, uh, to essentially draw the first uh, Asian American majority district in the entire state. and. You know, I'll use this opportunity. I've, I do have some statistics here as to what changed in terms of majority minority districts, which are 50% and above. Uh, with the two, this is in comparison to 2001 to now with the redistricting, we gained in Congress from five Latino seats to nine. This is in, in the state of California. From uh, uh, the the uh, Latino seats uh, in Senate stayed the same at five. And the assembly seats went from nine to 15. Uh, okay. Now, there was one Asian seat that was created, and that's the one that I am uh, currently drawn into. And uh, the Af zero African American and only one Asian. But again, keep in mind that this is only districts that were drawn where 50% of the population, regardless of registration, is of that specific ethnicity. That doesn't mean that uh, you know we still have uh, uh, African American state senators and assembly members that represent uh, portion or, or districts that are less than 50 percent. But that's just kind of kind of the change. But uh, that's uh, uh, I think I, I, I uh, you know what Steve mentioned about Howard Berman and him taking on the Dream Act and that kind of thing. I think that's that's a uh, uh, an elected representative there that is aware of the issues that, uh, in his district. Obviously, he knew this district was becoming more Latino. And you know, if I'm him, I'm thinking, I better do something uh, for this particular constituency uh, so that I can demonstrate that I'm uh, uh, basically representing my constituency. Yeah. Next question. Let me add one more thing to my, my answer, though. I'll say this. Because in, in one sense, you get the elation of a congressional seat. At the same time, we also have a Senate seat that went from being a Latino uh, majority minority seat with with the citizen voting age population above 50 percent to now one that's dropped to about 38 percent so the, the the question is in four years is does our state senator continue to be Latino or not so it's kind of an interesting it's a mixed bag for us too hi my name is Mukta Mohan and this question is for mr. Steve Ferris um, the new the new college board report says that only about 19 percent of Latinos have earned an AA degree or higher um, what is the Community College Board doing to combat this issue and to address the needs of the Latino community? Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I, I get, we spent the last few months being on the board. All people want to know is, you know, construction By the way, he just waste. started on July 1st, <laughs> right? Um, you know, uh, that, that's the core mission of what we're supposed to be there for. And we have a couple of things we confront. Um, first of all, college readiness. Um, Students don't get to us college ready. Uh, you know, uh, LAUSD is our principal feeder. Uh, only about 14% of the students are college ready when they get there, meaning that they essentially have to do basic and remedial classes in order to get up to speed. And a lot of it is there's a lot of frustration of having to take so many classes before you start getting credit classes that can be transferred over or that could lead to a degree. Uh, that's a very difficult experience. And 
um, you know, so some of this is, you know, we've kind of reached out with LAUSD and, and figured out how we got to work together. We've got to figure out where we're, we're funding and putting out pro bridge programs to get it started much earlier. We're doing stuff like concurrent enrollment where we'll take juniors and seniors in high school and start them on the process of, of the college education. Uh, and then I think we have, you know, we're, we've adopted something district-wide called Achieve the Dream. And it's a, it's a program, it's a uh, essentially top to bottom changeover, curriculum changeover, uh, not curriculum, but it's approach changeover. And a, a lot of it's how uh, we embrace the, you know, the, the student experience and how to embrace adjusting to what we have. And basically, I mean, our goal is as soon as students can come in, no matter what kind of college readiness there are, they're gonna advance. And they're gonna go to, you know, we're gonna emphasize course completion. We're gonna do some interesting things statistically like uh, knowing uh, like opening up uh, some of the enrollment, because we know that if a student isn't enrolled the first day of class there, um, and they try to come in and sneak in a little later, or, or they're gonna drop out. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to do all these little kind of interesting things with data analysis, um, real time, knowing where students are at real time, getting feedback real time as to why they dropped a class, why they didn't complete a class. All those kinds of things lead us, because our, you know, one of our top priorities is, is completion. We wanna see them complete, and it's, it's also the president's ideal. Uh, they, we want to see them complete certificates. We want to see them complete a transfer process. We want to see them complete um, some kind of uh, career program. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of pieces to it, a lot of moving parts to it, but, um, but really it, it's kind of an approach from top to bottom. It starts at the K level and it continues even beyond this because I'll tell you this, one of the things about community college that's amazing is that even if you do get your degree and go on to, you know, get your transfer, go on to UCLA or go on wherever, you or may L want to go or back. Or LMU. Or LMU. <laughs> or LMU. You may end up wanting to come back to the community college to refine a skill set. If you become a small business entrepreneur, for example, and you decide, well, I, I didn't take, you know, uh, accounting at, at, uh, at LMU, but I'm off doing this, you know, this really cool business and making some money, now I gotta figure out how to account for my books. Some, you know, basic accounting might actually be helpful to understand you know, that process. So all those kinds of things are pieces. We're lifelong, you know, we're focused on lifelong learning, but we do have a huge problem with that beginning completion rate and that opportunity, especially Latino students to transfer forward. So how do you know what people want as an elected official, and how do you know what Latinos want? And is it what Latinos want different than what blacks would want or whites would want? Uh, Luis? Yeah, well, I, th I think part of it is really get, getting to know your constituency. When I first got elected to the city of Alhambra, I didn't realize there were so many uh, ethnic organizations within the city. Uh, there could be, uh, you know, four or five events in the Chinese community alone in one night, and they're all competing. Uh, they're, they're also, there's also so much diversity within those organizations. Some folks, you know, I mentioned earlier the difference, there's a huge difference between for instance, Cantonese and uh, Mandarin, and where those folks come from, um, you know, just like night and day, some, some folks are, are uh, a little bit older and a little bit more traditional in some sense, and some are a little bit more modern than others, and the same with the, with the Latino constituents. So I think the key is to identify the key groups and constituencies within the city, and then form a relationship with those particular uh, organizations or groups and then have the one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings or, or the group meetings with those particular constituencies and uh, you know, have an open dialogue about what they uh, would envision. You know, for instance, we have a new group in town that is uh, really advocating for uh, bike paths in the city, something that's in line with you know, something I had been thinking about for a long time. But now there's a group, you know, there's a group large enough, about 50, that are advocating for this. So we can take those folks now before our council and advocate. As a matter of fact, we've already made some progress in terms of including, as part of our general plan, uh, bike paths and you know wider pedestrian uh, sidewalks, so that we can uh, uh, you know make this uh, more make this more friendly for bikers and pedestrians. Our city. Luis Ayala, Steve Vettis, Francisco Leal. Uh, thank you for coming to Loyola Marymount University and talking to us. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. All right, we'll see you all next week.